Thank you, Keisha, for being our technical producer today. Good morning and good afternoon to you all. Welcome to our Women Get On Board virtual speaker series. We're excited, very, very excited uh, to have a topic, the great chair. I actually have my book in hand here. I haven't quite finished it yet, but I'm hoping I'll learn more today in today's session. Uh, I'm Deborah Rosati, founder and CEO of Women Get On Board. We are a member-based company that connects, promotes, and empowers women to corporate boards. We have over 700 members across Canada and some down into the US. We are a diverse membership base and our goal simply is to get more women on boards. So having sessions like this to empower individuals to be more effective in the boardroom and if you're chairing a board or chairing a committee, we have a lot to learn from our author of the great chair, Brian Hayward. So without further ado, um, the agenda is basically going to have, we're going to have a fireside chat with Scott Baldwin, and he is going to interview Brian Hayward, who is the author of The Great Chair. Uh, we have been very fortunate. Brian has offered a discount to all of those that have attended this session. So uh, there is a code, and hopefully if you haven't got his book, um, you certainly can uh, access and, and uh, use the code for his book. So I'd like to introduce Scott Baldwin, and I'm not really sure where I start. We have a formal uh, bio on Scott, but I really want to start with, I love reading his blogs every Sunday morning. Um, he is so informative. He's so practical. I started stalking Scott back in the fall time, uh, and he's got a organization, a company called Director Prep, who is our sponsor today. So thank you, Scott, and thank you, Director Prep. And really, he takes uh, the approach from a governance perspective, from a really practical That's side. Right and there. this is what we're going to That's see. A and, uh, location for us. Um, can and someone go on to... mute, please? And you need Dr. Dr. Nair, uh, um, David, because us. all those doctors will stay if he's there. Uh, and, and, somebody, and hey, everyone. Uh, uh, someone is not on mute here. That's just the reality of it. Uh, uh, sorry. sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Um, that, yeah, that was a, a nice interruption. Um, anyway, so Scott, delighted to have you. Scott is a, uh, an experienced corporate director. He's a certified board director. He's a co-founder of Director Prep. He, his um, company, Director Prep, is an online hub for directors to prepare for meetings that they can contribute, collaborate, and influence de decisions. And it was really through Scott's um, blogs that I discovered the great chair and uh, said, hey, we should really get Brian speaking at one of our speaker series. So mm -hmm. I'm now going to turn it over to you, Scott. Thank you so much. We look forward to your interviewing Brian. Over to you. Thank you. Hey, Deborah. Thank you. And, and you know, we're truly honored to be here today and, and welcome the opportunity to uh, be in front of your, your audience. And uh, let's get started. Uh, Brian Hayward is our guest today. And as you know, he's the author of the new best-selling book on chairing boards called The Great Chair. And you know, several, several hundred copies of this book have been snapped up already. So here's a little bit about Brian's background, give you a little context uh, to the fellow you're gonna meet. Uh, he is a certified uh, corporate director, actually has two director designations, the charter director and the ICD.D. He has participated, probably the most important thing today in terms of context, in over 500 board meetings, either as a board director, a chair, or a CEO. And he has chaired numerous boards in the private, public, and volunteer sectors. He's worked with startup boards and those that have been around for years and years. He most recently chaired a startup company, it's been in the news recently, in the agribusiness tech space, which recently went public. So from startup to going public on the Toronto Stock Exchange, and that company is known as Farmer's Edge. And he's the current chair of a life sciences company, Cerebra Health, which is focused on the digital analysis of sleep. He's a director on the board of Wellington Altus Private Wealth. And you think he'd be running a little bit short on time. He's a volunteer on many of our nonprofit boards here in Manitoba, including work today at Rezo Compassion Network. Brian first became a CEO at the age of 34 for the agribusiness that became known as AgriCorps United. And currently today, he has his own consultancy, Eldare Resources, which does executive coaching, board governance work, and mediation among other things. So just a side note, Brian was my successor as chair of the Manitoba chapter of the Institute of Corporate Directors, where he continued our efforts to recruit women to the ICD's local chapter executive, which now is 
very capably chaired by Marilyn Brennan. Brian, I'd like to welcome you to Women Get On Board's speaker series. It's great to be here and thanks for that introduction, Scott. And, and thanks to Deborah and the membership for uh, the interest that you've expressed uh, in the topic and, and the book. Uh, and I'm, I'm really quite, as I say, honored to be here. So let's get into it. Great, okay, Brian, softball question right off the top. Um, don't mess it up. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Share, share with us your motivation for writing the book. Yeah, you know, you mentioned in the intro that I'd been through uh, 500 plus board meetings. I, I've, I've kind of lost count on that. And, and uh, at, at a point in time, I sort of thought, you know, there's all these meetings and there's really nothing that I can sort of point to that differentiates a great board meeting from a crappy one. And, and is it the people? Is it the is sandwiches, et cetera? Um, and probably the moment in time when I actually said, I've got to put something to paper, I was actually at a seminar with Newman Ashraf, who some people I probably know from director education. Uh, I was a resource there and I went up at a break and I just said, has anybody written anything or do you know of anything where people can tap into, you know, how to be a chair? And he just went, no. And I asked the same question to Rick Powers and he got the same answer. And uh, so I just started writing and, um, you know, as anybody has a book, you'll see, uh, I was honored actually to uh, spend a, a, probably a couple of days, Scott, was it, with a, a crappy manuscript that I gave to him with 20 pages. And um, hey, by the way, your manuscript, I've got it up on eBay right now. I'm trying to pay someone. To <laughs> Yeah. Now, actually, you know, the inspiration, uh, just to, to give you an attaboy um, and, and the influence, what people really like about and uh, uh, the book in, in large measure is that I brought some stories to the table. So I actually, when I finished it, Scott said, there's not enough Brian in here. So I actually added in 13 stories that are true uh, and, uh, and really kind of bring it to life. So. Well, thank you. Um, let's just continue to set the table for today's discussion. What do you want the reader to take away from your approach to chairing boards? You know, there's probably a couple of three things that I think are, are pivotal. And, and now because the book's been out for a few months, I'm getting back uh, feedback on this. But I, I think as whether you're a director or a chair or chair of a committee, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the pieces that I think are, are central to great board meetings is that first of all, the board and the chair own the agenda. Uh, so making sure that you're sitting there, you're very focused on what the discussion is going to be about. Uh, second point would be is, is regards trust. And that's probably bubbled up as being one of the things that seems kind of intuitive, but a lot of people go, you know, I really like that trust thing. And, and then finally, um, which is, you know, the sort of the back end of the book actually is, is developing yourself and taking ownership. I, I have my own sort of uh, acronym of being purposeful, PDF, purposeful, deliberate, and fun, and sort of doing quirky things, uh, et cetera. So those three things, the agenda, building trust, and then, and then personal development would be uh, you know, the final one. Okay, thank you. So what I'm hearing, and, and maybe based on some conversation we had beforehand, uh, for the folks in the audience to be thinking about these three themes that are likely going to weave their way through our discussion today around the board, right? The board's job on the agenda, the chair, building trust and developing yourself. So let's, if we could, and, and keep those questions coming in. I see on the chat function, uh, as Deborah has mentioned, uh, that's where we're going to get to at about 40 to the hour. So please bring your questions. And now let's, as we shift to um, the role of the board chair and effective governance overall, Brian, can anyone become a board chair? What about a great chair? What sets them apart? Yeah, I, I mean, being a chair, uh, you know, I, I've got a, a bunch of slides, but, I, you know, some people look at it as just being a traffic cop where you 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 collect a wheelbarrow or a shopping cart full of items. Then you're a metronome and you're just kind of keeping track of the time. And then you're a box ticker going, yep, we did it, we did it, we did it. You know, that kind of chairing, I think anybody can, can probably do that. But I think, you know, the, the thing that's distinguished, and I was reading something this morning, actually, Scott, uh, about influence that came in my, my Harvard email. And, and the piece, there's a quote that I, I scribbled down here. 
uh, that sort of summarizes is mastery of the dance of human interaction. Oh, and, and it's all of this being there and understanding what the organization's all about, what the critical issues are, what are the risk factors, what, what is the conversation need to be focused on? And, and so all of the mechanics that when you go to a course or you read, you know, an article that summarizes, say, okay, I get the materials out on time, do this, do this, do this. But it really, the point that gets missed and is the essence, I think, of, of elevating is to get into that mastery of the dance of human interaction, knowing what is important to the group and, and, and making sure that that conversation is very fruitful, meaningful and, and engaging and that, and that people are, are comfortable in, in expressing their opinions and, even, and, and pulling out the people that are quiet, who probably have an opinion and they, they, they need to be drawn out. And that's that dance uh, that needs to be of human interaction. That we, the, a great chair uh, probably needs to be uh, on top of. So would you suggest that this notion of mastering the dance, I really quite like that, that is contributing to your interpretation of what is effective governance and more importantly, the role that the chair might have in achieving that. You know, absolutely. And, and you know, when, when I send uh, a book out uh, myself, uh, I actually sign it and, and, and there's a bookmark that goes inside it, which says, uh, as a quote from Michelangelo, I'm still learning right. that he said when he was 87 years old. So I don't think you ever can completely understand just like each of us, you know, anybody that's had children or being in a, you know, a relationship, you, you just don't, you never stop learning. And, and I think, I think chairing is, is the same thing. It's, it's a journey. It's not a, it's not a destination. So what's been your experience, um, Brian, in the board that you've been on or involved with, I'll call it the laddering process where someone gets on a board and they might have different roles until they, um, become the chair or get asked to become the chair on that board or a different board. Um, do you find the laddering process is different for men or women in terms of board leadership? You know, I, I don't think it should be at all. And, and, and my, my thought on, on all of this is it, it's actually not a man woman thing as much as I think the way that you understand and the journey begins is to actually take the initiative uh, and actually get into that mode of chairing. And I, you know, sometimes I think of it like riding a bicycle or playing a guitar or skiing, water skiing. You just, you cannot read it in a book. Right. You don't know what it is until you get into that mode. And so whether it's, it's uh, you know, for men or women, I don't think the issue is, is as much gender-based as, as much as it getting that journey started, as you call it laddering, don't wait for some kind of succession plan. Uh, I think, you know, regrettably, there's been a lot of situations where uh, in the past that, and, and, and today where the sort of inclination is, is that, oh, well, we'll go to Joe or Sam, et, et cetera. But, but I think, you know, when, I, when I've encountered women that actually say, you know what, I actually, have. I'd like to chair something. Don't, don't, you don't even need to shoot for the stars and say, I want to chair the board, chair a committee and express that interest and get in that seat because you do not know what it's like. And, and it's not just my opinion. It's one of the things that's come back to me, just resonated back in a fire hose where people are going like, I really like that book because you know what you captured? You captured what it's like to actually sit in that chair because you don't know what it's like until you're actually doing it. So, so it's, I, that's, you know, step up. And, uh, and you know, I, I was looking at uh, some of the stuff on women get on board, the, the values, be authentic, passionate, uh, communicate beyond expectation. And one of that part of that communication is to say, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to chair the, that committee. But definitely part of the chair's job to be probably chief communicator number one. Absolutely. Yep. Totally. Okay. Well, let's do, let's uh, move over to how effective uh, board chairs actually get the job done. And I'm going to ask you off the top, um, and this is kind of relating to some questions that are coming in. Uh, how does an effective board chair engage their colleagues to reach a consensus? And maybe you might even tie this in a little bit toward uh, 
the virtual meeting space we're in today because of the pandemic? Sure, uh, I mean, I've framed it here uh, with what to do and but then how to do it because I think the 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 issue if you own the agenda uh, then then you can get into you know what the conversation uh, sounds like. Um, so you know beyond the sort of mechanics of building an agenda and sequencing it. The, what, what, is, what a board meeting really is, and I learned this through taking training in mediation, a board meeting is really just a negotiation. It's a fancy negotiation. It's not like going to a, a market and trying to buy a, a, a souvenir or, or whatnot. It's actually with people that you know and, and getting into a mindset of, of actually, and this comes from the book, Getting to Yes, where, where essentially, you know, the, uh, the authors put out four key cornerstones of how you actually have successful negotiations. And so the four of them are getting, separating the people from the problem. Don't, and this gets into some of the stuff that you write a lot about, Scott, on asking great questions. Mm -hmm. and, and so ask the question, why? Why, why is this important to you? Uh, and, and brainstorm. When I say I like, like to have uh, to you know, apply to myself to be PDF, purposeful, deliberate, but fun. When people are relaxed and there's some humor, they get creative. And actually, you know, coming, uh, when, when you look at negotiation training, brainstorming and coming up with divergent thinking sort of modes is actually a way to flesh out different kinds of ideas. And then once you've got those on the table, then get into convergent mode and then actually look to see with objective criteria is to, is to figure out which of the ones that have surfaced are, are the ideas that make the most sense. Doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be right, but you, you at least have a unity and a consensus uh, going forward. And, and the ways to do that, the how to do it, you know, gets into this issue, as I said, has bubbled up and I put the red line under it is building trust because once if you if you have trust, then you you actually can start to explore in a way where you don't feel threatened. And, and so asking questions and, and the sort of segue out is how do you build trust, you know, because we'll, we'll probably be talking about that I know is be vulnerable and, and in a board setting that doesn't mean talking about you know, whether your childhood was good, bad, or whatnot, it's actually trusting and, and being deliberate means sharing some information that instead of sitting there and saying, well, I don't know if I should say that, I don't know what people think about me, I feel a little bit threatened, go, you know what? Yes, I feel threatened, but I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna be deliberate. I am gonna give away some information. And I hope the other person is gonna have empathy I hope the other person is going to be compassionate and I hope the other person supports me when I feel vulnerable and I, and I put something out there uh, that is a little quirky or odd. Uh, so don't make fun of me. Maybe have a, have a joke with me, but don't make fun of me. So let me follow up on that a little bit. So what's the chair's role in helping to ensure that the culture is such around the board table that people feel comfortable to be vulnerable? Yeah, I, it's, I think it goes back to values and again, reinforcing as a chair uh, that there, the, the, the fundamentals of culture to me reside in values. You know, and, and in the book, I talk about that a little bit that, you know, there's a lot of seminars and, and whatnot these days and training that say boards are responsible for culture. And, and I actually don't think that's quite hits the mark. Because I think boards, by virtue of the fact that maybe a, a director, you know, spends a couple of hundred hours a year, they're there on a maybe a monthly basis is the most. It, they they can't be there every day. The culture happens minute by minute. The way somebody talks to you, their tone of voice, uh, you know, their body movement, whatever. And 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 so I think the important thing that a board can do and a chair can do is, is, to inst is to make sure values are clear, articulated very clearly, and, and people can remember what they are, and that everybody walks the talk too. 
if you see somebody offside, then you, you, you actually say, you know what, that's really not consistent with our values. You know, one of the stories I, I actually liked the best was, was Warren Buffett back in the early 90s when he was with Solomon Brothers and there was untoward things happening. Uh, he actually went before Congress and you can get this on YouTube and he apologized as chair of the board for the behavior of the organization. And he, he's passionately saying, and the 8,500 employees of Solomon Brothers don't, that's not their values. And I'm here to tell you that that's not how we, that's not how we roll. Not exactly his words, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but true tone, you know, to that phrase that we often hear tone at the top. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So just as before we move on, I just want to confirm with you that in terms of the, the primary tools in the great chair's toolbox for running an effective meeting, I think I heard you say it's about the agenda. Yeah. And I think to, to get into that, Scott, there's some technical things that I think you know, in the book, I've got actually something that I put together that I think you even said resonated with you. It was the four lanes of, of, of making, categorizing decisions. So there's level one decisions, level two and three and four. Level four is like, you're betting the farm, the organization is at a fundamental turning point where it's gonna crater or it's gonna do, there's, it's a major, major issue about survival or direction. At the other end is who's going to sign the checks, and and the, running the agenda means collecting the things in part and making the decision. Being effective means taking the things that are mechanical, administrative, parking them in a consent agenda, get them out of the way, and and to me I, I call it SPF fifty. Make sure that the agenda is at least fifty percent S strategy. P, people, F, finance. Make sure you got at least half of your agenda, at least half, de dedicated to those things. Don't let the other stuff that gets piled in the shopping cart uh, clutter up the agenda so that, and I've seen it enough times where all of the administrative stuff gets dealt with. They go, oh, look at that. The time's just flown by. We need to actually pass this resolution on whether or not we're going to do such and such. And it doesn't get the right conversation. Yeah, I think I, I once watched an organization pass its annual six million dollar budget in the last minute and a half of a board meeting. Yeah, there's a story in the <laughs> book where where somebody came in and just circulates this thing that they got, and and it's like, yeah, okay, here's this banking deal. Um, it's it's happened too many times, and and it's be you know you can say it's the chair's fault, but but I always like uh, you know uh, I've got another slide that's not in in this presentation, but but you know the the second item on most agendas is approval of the agenda. That means the whole board is actually gonna go, yeah, okay, I'm good with that. And, and, and so it's not just the chair, it's the chair and the CEO that really should create that SPF 50 framework where, where that, they're, they're decluttering too. You know, if Sally or Jim says to me, you know, we should talk about how we're gonna celebrate our 50th anniversary as an organization. You go, yeah, that's that's fine, a good idea, but I don't think we need to take up board time on that. Uh, so you have to declutter, and it, and it's a very deliberate thing. It's way easy to put more stuff on the agenda than to take it away, to get reports to the to the directors that get increasingly long. Uh, I was on the board of uh, Business Development Bank of Canada for eight years before we used diligent. And the last time that we actually had physical documents, I got two FedEx boxes this deep. It was like 1,500 pages of material. And I like traveling to go to the meeting uh, with carry-on luggage. I had to check it in because that's how much stuff I was getting and, and, and it's overwhelming. So being focused, being deliberate um, and, and, you know, again, this sort of amusing uh, little, you know, one liner is I, I would have written you a shorter letter, uh, except I didn't have the time. So <laughs> That's a great point. And I think you'd, you'd agree that in terms of the presentation of management reports and things coming to the board, that's the chair has a big role in working with the CEO or executive director on yeah. that and getting that into, into a form that's digestible and meaningful and has impact. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I want to, I want to move over to what I think is a, a real core aspect of your book. And in your book, you talk about the great chair's T intersection when managing the affairs of the board and that relationship with the CEO. Um, Brian, curious for our group, what, what are your suggestions 
you know, to enhance that relationship in both directions. So uh, there's, this is very deliberate. So when you're looking at the screen, um, what, what may not be evident, or it, maybe it is, is that, that green, the green arrow, uh, the, the green central piece, the, the graphic, is in the shape of the letter T. So I've called this the trust T. So you are, as a, as a chair, you're a trustee of this central uh, concept, this central mode of operating is, is, is you are responsible for cultivating and ensuring and incubating a trustful environment and making sure that it, that it, it sustains going forward and, it, and it's in the moment. And, and when I thought about my experiences on boards and trust and what, what I found was, and, 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 and then I'm kind of validating it, I guess, in a way, by you know reading stuff from people like David Beatty, uh, who said you know when the when the CEO chair relationship deteriorates, one or the other has to go, right. and 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 he's res he's probably been much more articulate than I would ever be, on the fundamental need for the chair and the CEO to have a trust level that is unbelievable. And in the middle of COVID last year, he did a webinar, and he was talking about how. The CEO and the chair, they, they don't need to be drinking buddies and they go, you know, out to dinners and, and whatnot, but they have to actually be like simpatico in a way that they're, they're virtually best friends. So that if somebody's, and, and, and the kind of relationship I'm talking about is, is actually between the CEO and the great chair is, is if, if the CEO is, is actually got a drinking problem, and he needs to, to go and, and take a week or two off and disappear to get counseling or some kind of remedial therapy. You know, to be able to walk in and say as a CEO, I have a problem. Uh, I don't know whether this happened or not, but we've seen situations where there's inappropriate relationships between various members of, of senior management and organizations and, and subordinates. To be able to say, I have a problem. I have cancer. I've got this. And it might be the chair even. I had a situation where I was working with a chair who had an illness. And, and so it's that level of virtual intimacy that needs to be created. Because once you're in that environment and, and you know it when you get there, and that's why I say back to the beginning point, you don't know what it's like until you're sitting there as chair and somebody comes in and says, it's, I have a problem. This is what this is what's going on, and and it's it's two way, and and so that's the that is something it, as a chair, you need to be vulnerable. Uh, personally, what I do is as I've actually stolen something out of YPO, which is a lifeline. I sit down with somebody I'm working with that closely, and I just say, "Here's me. Did you know about my child? Did you know about this? This is where I'm coming from. I need you to know me." And, and I hope that you're going to share that as well. So that, and it's in complete confidence. And, and, and I think that that, that allows, uh, I think, a level of conversation where uh, as a CEO, you, you might go in or, and say, you know, I, I'm thinking about firing somebody, but I just, I'm not sure. Or the chair might go, you know, uh, the board's really kind of worried about how you're handling this situation. Have you thought about doing this or that? Right. It's that it's that two way level of communication mm -hmm. that is 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 really important. With peer directors, I, I think it's quite different. I, I think you you can't expect a chair to have that kind of level of intimacy with five or seven or nine other people, and then there's people coming on the board and leaving, and and and, and you know there's distance issues a lot of times. So I I think. The issues on trust on a lateral basis are different than the ones on vertical basis. The lateral ones have to do with integrity, have to do with professionalism, having confidence that the chair has confidence that people have read the materials, they're being thoughtful. Uh, and and the, peer, the directors need to have confidence that the chair has got their finger on the pulse. The, the old nose in, fingers out. If there's one person that should kind of break that rule, 
could be the chair. Just like, yeah, I'm my nose and fingers out, but I like to know a little bit more. I've got my, I do have my finger on the pulse of the organization. I'm not managing it. I'm not micromanaging it, mm -hmm. but I know enough that if I smell something going wrong, I can alert other people and we can start to have a conversation. So it's much more of a professional trust than a, than a personal one, Scott. So in that case, the, 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 the chair is going to lean in a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so the, as you were talking, I, something came to my mind in, uh, in building this trust in the various areas in the, in the relationship between the board chair and the CEO. And in your travels, what have you noticed similar or different when the, when the gender of the two people is not the same? I, I, I really... Uh... I don't, I don't really look at it. I, I can't say that I really noticed a lot uh, on that front. I personally, I put myself out there sufficiently. I, I'm sure I've got blind spots because uh, I, I know people tell me I've got blind spots, but uh, yeah, no, I, 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 I'm not, I'm not, I think when you're in that level of professionalism in that, uh, I don't, I, what I've found when you're, you're referencing international, uh, I, I find that there's cultural things that emerge that are very awkward at times. I was on a board at South Africa for five years. And as much as that was post Mandela, the, the, the aroma of racism permeated the room and, and was, was just underneath sort of around in the corners in the dark, even though it wasn't, you know, evident. So I think every organization has its own culture and, and legacy and, and, uh, and it's all of our jobs really to, you know, to, to do what the Harvard people is they focus on the issues, fo take, take away the people and, and focus on the problem, not the people. Thank you for that. And yeah, that South African experience must've been really, uh, and your other international travels to Australia and other boards that you've served on yeah, something yeah. There that you're getting uh, culturally as you, as you travel. And yeah, it's, support. it's very different. Yeah. You know, even, even I, I had issues, I know we're, you know, you and I, Scott are in, in the, you know, the, the prairies of Canada, but you go straight down South, take a two hour flight into the corn belt and into Iowa, Nebraska, Illinois. And the mindset there is very different as well. Yeah, but you know, on some of those boards, Brian, you weren't the chair. You were a director on that board appointed by the investor or whatever that situation might have been. So in any of these scenarios as a director, how can you best support the work of your chair? Yeah, I, 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 good question. Again, I, supporting the work is, is actually, again, I, I am, I'm a big fan of being proactive. Uh, if you're on a board, uh, you know, the meeting's going fine and there's, it's kind of happening nicely, whatnot. Uh, don't just uh, take it and, and then leave and say, well, that was a nice quiet meeting. You know, I, I'm somebody that goes over to the chair and says, and provides feedback, whether they actually ask for it or not. Uh, as a chair, I go, I actually go to people and say, yeah, was that meeting okay? Is there something we should do better? Uh, was, it, was it too long? Did I also, I very much uh, want to be mindful because the, the, the lessons from uh, research show chairs should be kind of quiet. Chairs, are, the worst chairs to me are the ones that have air done. And it, there's a, a chart in the book uh, from uh, Stanislav Shechnia uh, <laughs> where good chair takes 5% of the airtime, bad chair, 30 or 40% right. of the airtime. Okay, so this is to a question that came in. Um, what if the chair and the CEO are the same person? Uh, I'm not a big fan of that at all. And, and we don't and see so, much of that in Canada, right? Or more? No, no. I, you know, uh, you know, in the book, there's a chart that shows that that tendency is going down. And but I've actually um, uh, pointed to Boeing as, as right out of the gate, uh, trying to grab. I didn't want this book to be a doorstop. I want it to be fun and readable because there's enough boring governance books. So I wanted to grab people with Robert Maxwell drowning and, uh, and actually what happened with Boeing where, and the board was unanimous. The two planes crashed, the board says, oh no, we don't need to sh split these roles, unanimous. And then, oh yes, six months later, unanimously say, well, we'll split the roles. And then uh, three months later, right around Christmas time on December 23rd, uh, I think we'll just get rid of the guy anyways, but we won't split the chair and the CEO. 
it's still, as far as I know, Boeing, right. there's actually an interesting interview uh, that was about a month ago with a, with a gentleman on a podcast from Harvard who's going into it and saying, this is where it started going wrong. He's actually, without getting in and using our time here now, is he said, when you have this person, there's no other perspective and nobody's asking the right questions. No. And so, uh, you know, maybe Elon Musk has got it. Uh, I, I don't, it's, it's, uh, I, I just, I'm not, I, I think it's fundamentally wrong. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit now about how an effective board chair can actually, can lead the board well. And if you might, let's get right into around the linkage between an effective board and an organization that executes well on its strategy. What role does that chair have in that? effective execution of strategy. Yeah, and I, I, I think, Scott, we just got to go back again to the agenda. What belongs on the agenda? What doesn't belong on the agenda? And so I actually uh, have to give you uh, an, uh, an assist in the, in the Hockey Game of Life for introducing me to this book, um, which is part of what I was sharing in my book. And this actual slide comes, the blue part uh, on the right-hand side comes from Princess Otto, uh, family run company, but uh, Jeff Rodchen was the CEO and I was the chair. And we actually took that book and used this as a template because as a family owned company, there's all sorts of situations where people were saying, you know what, I think I'm going to get involved in this or not. And we go like, no, no, we actually need crystal clear what belongs on the agenda. When is it appropriate for the board to actually get involved in, in a dialogue. And, and that's where you have things like strategy um, and culture is there. But, but Jeff and I actually looked at it as, as that values were the things that the board needed to find on the far on the bottom left-hand corner. But there's, you'll notice there's monitoring where you're really just, you're not actually using a lot of airtime. And then there's a bunch of other things that actually, again, Back to decluttering the conversation, getting getting things out of the room that shouldn't be there. Uh, too many times, a board meeting will get again uh, tied up with you know how are we going to celebrate the 50th anniversary? I was in a board meeting because we moved offices where where people, I wasn't chairing. We spent a half an hour on the color of the carpet and what kind of texture did we want? And I, and I was. And I guess I'm partly guilty because I should go, are we really, is this why we should be in this room talking about this? It's just wrong. So effectiveness means, you know, living this, but also educating and, and having an opportunity to have sufficient conversation. So people understand when I say, no, we're not going to deal with that. It's going to go in a consent agenda. They go, yeah, no, I get it. Understand. Good move. So Brian, so, how does how does this graphic help you as a chair? One of the questions that came in was around the boundary between governance and operations. So for you as a great chair, aspiring uh, as we all are, how do we learn not to micromanage and yet feel on top of things? Yeah, uh, I, I think the the issue of, of micromanaging is it, it's a there's a line. I, I'm not sure that it's a crisp bright line, but it's reasonably clear that if things are operational, you can apply maybe some kind of litmus test to say, you know, if, if the amount of money involved here is in, you know, below a certain threshold, or if the, you know, the, the people involved, or uh, it's it, the time frame that we're discussing is within a matter of months that this decision really applies to. Uh, I think the important thing is, is to, use the intellectual capability of the directors and encourage the directors to actually say, I don't think this belongs on the agenda. Instead of saying, which happens too many times, we should talk about this. Right. And, and a lot of times it, it's, it can be one director, uh, you know, at it's, it's South Africa, I just referring to it, we had like 13 people on the board. And then one person says, you know, we should talk about what's going on with our operation in Botswana. Nobody else cared, but the rest of the board actually by their silence were being delinquent and, and myself included. I should have said, you know what? I don't think that's really worth talking about. It's not material to what, you know, I didn't fly, you know, 36 hours and spend $20,000 on logistics to come here and talk about something like that. That's not where you're going to get value out, out of the investment in my time. 
Okay. Um, Brian, we just got a couple of minutes. We're going to get into uh, questions from our audience. And again, just a reminder, if you have a question for Brian, please put it in the chat and we'll turn to those uh, shortly. Um, as we're, we're going to learn to, as we wrap this up, if I were serving as a chair for the first time and I came to you for advice, what would you say is the most important attribute for me as a new chair to focus on? I, I think it's actually uh, is be yourself, you know, learn from what you can. But I, I, I think being yourself and, and actually doing it, get in the chair and, and be, a, be a chair. And it's like riding a bicycle again, to use that analogy. Uh, when we all, you know, learn how to ride a bike, we don't remember it now, but I'm sure, you know, pretty well everybody fell and scraped their knee. And then somebody said, well, no, get back up there. And, 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 and so I think, you know, um, it, it's it, to go back to what we were talking about, the three points is, is self-development is initiate, express the interest to be a chair, get in the seat, do it, skin your knee, and then ask and say, do you see, did, what did I do? Give me some feedback here, please. Uh, I want, and then somebody might say, well, you're talking all the time. That's not what chairs do. Right. And they go, okay, thank you. Self-adjust. And, and uh, as I said, you know, uh, the Michelangelo quote, I'm still learning. Uh, I don't feel like I'm a great chair. I know damn well I'm better than what I was. And, and, but I still have meetings where people go, meh. <laughs> so it's okay. I go okay what did they do <laughs> and and it's uh and I I have my own confidence in, in you know so I think you know back to your question if you're if you're first time you know if you know somebody that you can actually know is going to give you the straight goods you know if I was on a board with you Scott or, or I don't really know Deborah Rosati that well but I know Deborah Rosati well enough that she's on a board with me and she actually said is and she's chairing it and she said well what how did I do Brian I I give her the straight goods. Uh, and that means you did this well, you didn't do this so well. Here's some ideas, opinion of one person, but, uh, but get in the chair, do it. And, and, uh, and cause doing it is the best experience. And that's why and back to your first question, why did you write the book after 500 board meetings? I'm going like, I just can't figure out and nobody's written anything down. And so at this point in my life, I'm just going to do it. Um, and my some final point is that I'm passionate about this because I don't, I think sometimes, you know, in this governance world that we're in right now, you know, there's, it's all about Bay street and this, and, and, you know, to me, this is our communities. I've had clients since I wrote the book that are in healthcare hospitals where the boards are screwed up. People aren't trusting each other. And, and, you know, from some of the conversations you and I have had, it's, and you go, you know what, this is all about us and how we, how our kids go to school. And you look at something like COVID, you know, I'm reading this stuff this morning and this is governance, like real time. You know, I've got one shot of AstraZeneca in me and then I'm reading that Alberta just going, nope. Uh, it's, this is not just health, this is governance and how do people make decisions and collectively agree on the purpose and where we're heading. It's, it's important to all of us. Brian, uh, thank you for that. And uh, I think what we should do at this point is get into our questions from the, uh, from, from the audience. And uh, what I'd like to suggest again to folks who are putting their questions in, if we don't get to everyone, because we do have a commitment to uh, turn you loose by the top of the hour, uh, we will have a way to get back to you and find a way to, to follow up and make sure that all of your, your questions are, are answered. So I'm gonna pull up the... Uh, the scroll bar here and let's just see Brian I think you've got access to it as well these are going to be let's try and keep these uh, fairly short snapper uh, responses as best we can um, oh there's yes, some Mr. People, Chair <laughs> yeah there's some people complimenting you on your book let's just ignore that <laughs> you know what I don't have that scroll bar so uh, okay right. I'm going to trust you with the scroll bar just fire away and I'll Okay, what tips do you have for board chairs who are faced with board directors who aren't engaged, particularly in between meetings? Quick hit. Interesting, because uh, we were talking about, before I went out on the plenary, uh, a couple of the things that have come up and bubbled back after I wrote the book. How do I deal with a bad director? Right. How can I deal with this situation? Um, 
self-assessment. Uh, you know, boards uh, typically go, yes, we should do a board self-assessment. And then, and I've been in these where once a year people sit down and go, well, how do you think we are doing? And everybody looks at me, we are doing well. And that's the end of the conversation. Yeah. And then they go, and in each person's mind, they're going to, well, I don't know about that Scott guy. He doesn't say much. And mm -hmm. you might be thinking, I don't know about that Brian guy. He talks too much. And unless somebody tells me that I'm talking too much or you don't talk enough, how are you supposed to know? Yeah. So that's a simple thing as much as anything. So getting into individual assessment. Um, talk to us a little bit about what it's been like for you chairing boards during the pandemic in this virtual environment. We have a few questions that relate to that and specifically around how you truly master that human interaction uh, in the pandemic when you can no longer meet and get to know each other on a more human level. Yeah, and that's actually when I read that this morning in the article I mentioned, uh, that's where it was coming from as much as anything. I was going like, and... and um, I mentioned David Beatty and, and what his comments were. And so the web, the very same webinar that I, I was on last year, I actually asked him a question, you know, how do you actually develop that personal connection? And his answer was, I don't, I don't think you can. I, in that regard, so which is a bit of a, a sort of a supplementary, I think once we're through the pandemic, what we're going to see and is it will be hybrid. There's, in my mind, and, and my experience back in South Africa, we were meeting quarterly. I was flying 36 hours, 36 hours on the ground, 36 hours back, four times a year. And then some bright bulb said, do we really need to do that four times a year? What if it was three times? And I, I, I think that depending on the organization and its, its level of dynamism, People will look at it and say, you know, maybe, and not to say, oh, we'll have one virtual, then one in person, and one virtual, one in person. I think what's going to evolve is people are going to say, you know, we should probably get together and talk about the direction of the company, or, or if there's, if there's a lot of things happening, you say, oh, we, we need probably need to talk more, um, more frequently in person. And once everything settles down, then we can probably go virtual. I, it's going to be a discovery process uh, over time, I think. Okay. And um, how would you recommend directors prepare to become chair beyond watching others? Who might be good or bad? <laughs> uh, as I, I said, you, you have to step up, find a way to chair something. And, and, and um, I think the step one is to actually share and communicate to use uh, Debbie Rosette, one of their values, communicate beyond expectation. Just go, you know, maybe it's a little extreme, but you know, you, you show up to your first meeting and, and you go to the chair, uh, it's a volunteer board and you say, you know, I'll go up and say, I'm here, uh, I'd love to chair a committee. Right. I'd love to chair, you know, it could be, I'd love to chair the golf tournament or, or the curling tournament or whatever it is. But getting you know getting in there and and communicating what your own interests are um and that's a way of being vulnerable too right so you so, go like so you're, you're ah, not, I, I don't think i'm comfortable doing that <laughs> so, go, don't go do it right and try it so you're making the point coming from the director's perspective if someone has asked a question around what role does the chair play in rotating committee chairs among the board members yeah i i i uh, again in in the what I've sort of thought through and, and, and referenced in the book is, is, you know, I think too many times what happens is there's, there's a little bit of linear thinking and, and to use the example I was using is, is uh, somebody comes on and they're a chartered accountant. They got a professional designation. They go, Oh, that person would be really good for the audit committee. And then there they go. And then there's, there's a linear sort of what you call laddering or succession. Oh, well, they've been on the audit for, then we're going to make them maybe audit chair in three years. And, and my thought is, no, get that person on to, because uh, I saw this at, when I was at uh, BDC. Uh, John McNaughton actually was quite uh, innovative on some of the governance things. And he moved somebody over uh, into HR that was from audit. 
but they made a great contribution because we were talking about the solvency of our pension plan. And, and, and then that, that person went back to audit a couple of years later, and it, then they knew a lot about the pension plan and the funding and all of the actuarial elements of figuring out whether there was a solvency issue or not. So I think cross-training is, is something that CHAIR has. And especially if there's, you know, if you combine individual assessment and, and, and cross-training, then, then the board, I think, can have much more intelligent and informed conversations as opposed to having almost like parliament, like the member for Rocky Horse Kicking Horse Mountain and the member for Newfoundland and, you know, people in their silos, get them out of their silos. Mm -hmm. and, and the chair's the agent to do that. So for the individual director or maybe a small group of directors who are realizing that the chair really isn't performing very well, or perhaps the agenda is running out of your, you're spending too much time to your example, talking about the color of the carpet. What, what can those directors do about it? You, you can have your board evaluation, self-evaluation, there's feedback on the chair, that kind of thing, but meeting to meeting, is there any suggestions? Well, I think part of the individual assessment needs to come uh, include the chair. Right. And, 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 uh, and, and so an enlightened chair actually uh, should, and my, if my, my, my advice would be is to say an enlightened chair should, if there's, if the organization is at a state where they have a governance committee or, or another uh, lead director or somebody else, trusted person, whatnot, is that the chair participates in that, but there's even another set of questions about how the chair is actually, uh, you know, performing as chair Mm -hmm. in, in addition to being just a, a director, because it is a different role. Chairs should be quiet. Chairs should be looking. I, I find it exhausting uh, it, personally, because uh, truth be known, and I'm being vulnerable here. <laughs> Go for it. When, when I'm a director, I zone out sometimes. I look at my phone discreetly, like I am. No, no, I'm not that. <laughs> and But when I'm chair, I'm actually looking and I'm to, you know, the example you're using Scott about somebody's quiet and I'm looking and going like, I wonder if Scott's really on side with this. He seems like he just, his body language is, and somebody who's that quiet for that long. And I know that they might have opinions because I've talked to them at a coffee break or whatever. And it's, it's my job to kind of go, Hmm. So what, what's your thought on this, Scott? And one of my uh, uh, secret sort of passions or whatever is I love Judge Judy and, and but because she's actually and there's people that hate her, but I, I actually go to school and Judge Judy because she's when she's going and so that you do Anything not else. <laughs> yep. Tell me more. Help me understand. Um, Judge Judy is there and she's very biased on dogs and people that have government assistance and whatnot. But she also has, I, I go to school watching how she watches people and figures out whether they're telling the truth or not, or whether they have another opinion. Interesting. Check my uh, satellite channel now and find <laughs> where she is. So you probably uh, get it on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> so. Yeah, that's true. So we've got an interesting question here. Would it be useful for a board to have criteria upon which to give feedback to the chair? Um, yeah, I, I, it's an interesting question. I'm not sure I understand it, but I'm going to run with it. Um, I think, you know, there are, when, when, when I'm asked about, doing assessments or individual assessments or collective assessments. I don't do them. I, I actually know of people like say, you know, Scott Baldwin, but there's other people besides Scott Baldwin that do that kind of work. Uh, and so the criteria to me, it, it, this, is a, this is actually as much as anything has to do with, with, you know, having a good set of questions, not criteria and, and, you know, Generally, my experience, what seems to work is there's some kind of, you know, general survey. What do you think about Scott? What do you think about Brian? What do you think about Deborah? Um, but then there's also that's supplemented with a phone call, 
five, 10 minutes. I'm, you're the guy that does this stuff and you're nodding. So I think that, you know, say, oh yeah, I got your thing. And, and having it confidential on a third party, I think is quite helpful because, and then that person can kind of integrate and put, pull all this together. Um, you know, having done that as a chair and sitting down with people, uh, you know, even when you're telling somebody something that, you know, you got to, it's, I, I look at it, it's like saying, you know, you got a piece of food on your mouth or your cheek. It's, it, it some people react badly, but for the most part, um, I, th I find, especially because directors are tend to be very professional, uh, they appreciate, it. they, do, they want to know they have a piece of food on their chin. It's it, thank you for telling me. I, I don't want to be, I, I want to be known as a good director that I can go to another board and make a great contribution. That's why I'm here. So help me, educate me. And, and in, a, in a perfect world, that may involve saying, you know, the ICD is running this course here. Uh, we'd like you to go on audit committee. And there's a two day, uh, you know, uh, course on, on, you know, audit committee effectiveness. You should go on that or HR effectiveness or cybersecurity. Uh, I, you know, I'm always picking around. I, I, you know, I was on the, the uh, women get on board uh, uh, session on artificial intelligence. And it was like really good. Um, uh, so, you know, get out there and explore. Okay. Um, so I think we have time for one more, maybe, maybe two if we're tight. Um, should the chair reach out to all or some directors prior to each meeting to better understand their position, their positions, perhaps on more complex items? Uh, great question. And, and so I know that uh, in, in, in my book, I, I actually took issue with David Beattie. Uh, he would say, yes, the, the chair should know where people stand on issues. I'm not sure I could get on a phone call and say, Scott, what do you think about us, you know, our strategy to go uh, online? And then you tell me and I go to somebody else I, and, and then I'm collecting all this stuff. And I think intuitively, whether it's real or you fall into it, you, you could run into actually kind of stage managing, even at mm -hmm. the meeting, go, oh, I know Scott's against that idea. So, oh, Scott, what do you think about that? Right. I, I, I don't think it builds trust. If it's a really like burning platform issue, I think getting some measure of what the playing field looks like. And that's where I think, you know, go back to mediation and the training I took in mediation. It's a facilitated negotiation as a board meeting. And so having people even represent a point of view or, or there's, there's different methodologies without getting into a complicated answer as to mm -hmm. how to deal with that. But no, I don't, I, I'm not a big fan of polling ahead of time. What about on a key issue, like a merger and acquisition topic or something? Um, are you, are you open to canvassing directors to, to make sure that the CEO is presenting and trying to answer all those questions in their presentation? You got to be very careful. And, and I learned this from ICD and, it, and it's in my, <laughs> do not ask this question. Okay, let's do a straw poll. <laughs> this is the wrong question and I cannot emphasize it enough. So it's, it's extremely dangerous. I think to, in my estimation, what should happen is the chair should actually just say, okay, everybody's had time to look at this and, and, and let's, let's talk about the issue, not, not to, to try to surface out positions in, in the interest of time because, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, and then asking, you know, to your point, and, and I'll, I'll echo Deb, Debbie Rosati is Sunday morning stuff, ask good questions, because you, you do that, you're going, here's things that, you know, uh, you could ask. And, you know, I, I, as you know, I, one of my favorite, if we weren't doing this now, would we start doing it? Exactly. Or, exactly. and this is a risk assessment question, which is, you know, talk to me why this is a bad idea. That's one I picked up from you. Right. Yeah. Tell, don't tell me why you like this. Tell me why we shouldn't do it. Right. Hey, Brian, I got one more question. This is going to wrap this up and you got to be tight because we're getting queued out here. Is the chair role for everyone? No, I, I, I think you need to, you want, you need to want to do it. I think it's great if you want to do it, but uh, no. Okay. It, it's like anything. Do you know, do I like all kinds of, you know, cuisine? No. Fair comment. Listen, um, 
Brian, help me if I don't get this quite right, but in terms of wrapping this up, we know that our three takeaways for being an effective board chair were to own the agenda, build trust, and to develop yourself in terms of your behavioral yeah. aspects and continuous improvement. Have I picked up that? Absolutely. Get out there and do it. And the only way that you're going to learn how to ride a bike is to ride a bike. Okay. And uh, you see on the screen, everyone who's on the, on the call today, uh, uh, you go to the, go to greatchair.ca and uh, there's, if you put in the discount code WJOB, you get a 50% discount on any of the formats for which Brian's book is offered. And uh, as we wrap up here, I would like to thank on behalf of Brian Hayward, all the team at Women Get On Board, Deborah Rosati, Keisha Williams, Laura English, and in case there's someone there I've forgotten. And so- And uh, Scott Baldwin and Director Prep for sponsoring. Yeah, come join us on the Savvy Director every Sunday morning. Thank you. Yeah, Never so uh, Scott and Brian, what a great conversation. And as I hold up your book, Brian, true to your word, you personally autographed and I'm still learning and that resonates in everything that you've talked about today. So I hope everyone goes away with the concept of still learning, but also stepping up and putting your hand up to say, I want that chair role, whether it's chair of the board or, and I have had my occasion where I have put my hand up because I was overlooked. So uh, I love the practical advice. Uh, Scott, thank you for director of prep being our sponsor for being an inquisitive and curious interviewer. Brian, for your insights, I encourage everyone to get a copy of the book. Just a couple, a little administrative. Uh, you will, everyone that's attended today will get a follow-up uh, thank you with a survey. We'd love to hear back from you on how we're doing. We love our assessments. We love continuous improvement so that we can always go beyond uh, expectations on communications. Also, our next speaker series, just FYI for everyone is September 14th and the topic is going to be getting climate change on the board agenda. Uh, so you'll get a link to that. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for joining us today. Be well and be safe.